Well, hello, everyone. This is J.B. Hickson with NBW Ministries, proclaiming the clear, accurate, and urgent gospel message coming to you from my studio beneath the sky, tucked away here under the tall timbers of Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Friday, April the 12th, and boy, have we got a great guest for you today. I've been looking forward to uh, talking with Zach from The Wretched Watchman ever since I first came across uh, his material. I think it was Tom Hughes that kind of pointed me in his direction and really have a kindred spirit, really appreciate the work that he's doing out there to awaken people and and just uh, talk about Bible prophecy. So we're going to be talking with Zach today about Trump, tyranny, and political theater, but I'll bring him on here in just a moment. Um, really appreciate him taking time to be with us today. But a couple of quick announcements as we wind up the week here. We've had a fantastic week with some great guests on a variety of topics. We kicked it off on Monday with uh, Strat Goodhue from uh, Honolulu, Calvary Chapel there at the Ranch Church, and uh, just talked about how the time is short, talked a little bit about the uh, eclipse and and also about a conference that we're going to be doing there in June and I uh, uh, can't wait to to get out there and meet him in person. Uh, we've actually met a couple times at conferences but this will be the first time we've shared the platform together. So that was Monday Strat Goodhue on Tuesday we had Dr. Christopher Cohn on to talk about education in these great last days of deception. Wednesday was a powerful show. We had Greg and Eric filling in for Randy. Uh, normally, we have Worldview uh, update on, uh, or World Events update, I should say, on Wednesdays, but uh, Randy's been taking a break for a couple of weeks, and uh, keep him in your prayers. But uh, Greg and Eric are with us. We talked about crypto, digital currency, uh, the U.S. banking system, precious metals, all kinds of stuff uh, in uh, prepare, preparation for what's coming down the pike. And then uh, yesterday, we had Mary Danielson on. We did a deep dive into history and talked about a king on the throne in Europe and how that might correlate to Daniel 2 and the, the rise of the one world political, religious, and economic system. Fantastic show. Uh, her article that was referenced yesterday is available in the free section of the Not By Works website, and I think uh, Brooke might also have uh, linked that up at the show uh, on the show notes there. But uh, check out those podcasts, and then, of course, we're wrapping it up today for the week with uh, Zach from The Wretched Watchman. Uh, also, I want to remind you, we've got the brand new app. It's been out for a week now. We're so excited. It's getting great reviews. I think we've had close to 1,500 people that have already downloaded it. Check it out at the App Store or Google Play Store. Just search NBW Ministries, NBW Ministries. And then yesterday, we launched the brand new NBW website. What a great uh, site that is. I'm so excited about it. Brooke worked really, really hard over the last several months to roll that out, and I uh, hope you enjoy it as well. Uh, all the content is there. You can find our videos, podcasts, devotionals, events, announcements, um, our live stream. By the way, this Sunday at Plum Creek Chapel, as we are going through 1 Thessalonians, we get to chapter 4, verse 13, and I'll be diving into the doctrine of the rapture. So we'll spend at least a couple of weeks on the rapture um, uh, there as we study 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. And you can live stream that if you're not in the Denver metro area. Uh, just go to notbyworks.org on the new website. Click the live stream button at 10 o'clock Mountain Time on uh, Sundays. Uh, so lots of events coming up. Be sure and uh, kind of check out the events tab. If we're in a city near you, be sure and stop by and say hello to us. Coming up, we'll be in Kansas, South Dakota, and Oklahoma over the next few weeks. And then, of course, the big cop, uh, Colorado Springs Prophecy Watchers Weekend right here in my home state, June 27th through the 30th. Uh, check that out on our website as well. Well, uh, tomorrow I'll be doing a Self-Reliance Expo or speaking at the Self-Reliance Expo at the Elbert County Fairgrounds here in Colorado. Uh, stop by and see us at the booth. I know they've got two big exhibit halls full of exhibitors and workshops and great uh, booths and resources for preparedness. We'll have a booth there. And then in the afternoon, tomorrow noon, I'll be, uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I'll be keynoting and talking about preparedness and how to fly below the radar. So that's tomorrow, Elbert County Fairgrounds. You can learn more at our website. All right, our verse for the day, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1, says, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but who he who hates correction is stupid. Yeah, stupid's a biblical word. Uh, it's also a pretty common trait these days, but uh, I, I, that's from the New King James Version. He who hates correction is stupid. And I, I thought it was a good verse for what we're going to be talking about today, because sadly, 
so many people, even many believers, have really kind of fallen prey to the great deception that is getting worse and worse, and and they're kind of locked in on their on their viewpoint, and and it's hard to tell them otherwise. And uh, I think they they are, are not really awakened to the reality of the world as it really exists. It reminds me of the famous Mark Twain quote. Uh, it is easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. And that's actually kind of a, a paraphrase that has kind of come to be attributed to him. But in my uh, book, Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1, I actually uh, reached, uh, did some research and found the actual quote. And what Mark Twain actually said, very similar, was how easy it is to make people believe a lie and how hard it is to undo that work again. And that is certainly... Uh, true. So hopefully today, as we talk with Zach, you'll begin to maybe be exposed to some things you haven't thought about. I want to encourage you to do your own research. But uh, Zach with the Wretched Watchman has a huge following on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search for Wretched Watchman. But Zach, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. This is truly a privilege and an honor. So thank you. Well, the honor is all ours, my friend. I, pr I promise you that. So I'd like to start by, um, you know, selfishly for my benefit, but I know it'll help a lot of our listeners as well. Tell us just briefly how you kind of got into Bible prophecy, maybe what your journey has been. I know you're coming to us from the Holy Land down there in Texas, and uh, so that's great. Uh, but uh, give us a little bit of your backstory, and then we'll dive into our topic. Sounds good. Yeah, so I grew up in a... a you know, God fearing Christian home. And uh, that was out in California of all places. Uh, you can, you can again, tell that I upgraded from California to Texas. Um, but yeah, I grew up, I mean, all my entire family, that's, they were just dedicated to the Lord. And so I grew up in that. And then we all come to, I won't say all, but a lot of us come to that age of selfishness and we want to drive what we want to do. And so I, lied to myself and I just said, well, God, I'm a musician. So God wants me to play music. And I got wrapped up in the NAR or the new apostolic reformation church for several years. And, um, it was then that I, uh, again, I didn't fall necessarily into the beliefs that they were doing, but I was clearly wrapped around in something that I shouldn't have been. And when I got out, um, it, the Holy Spirit pulled me out, I mean, dramatically, and he basically told me in a direction of what I need to study, what I need to learn. And um, I grew up with a dad who was heavily in the prophecy. And, you know, we were the tinfoil hat wearing kind where everybody would say conspiracy theory, which conspiracy is just a spoiler alert. Give it about <laughs> six months and it comes true most of the time. And so I took what I learned from my dad before I did my selfish journey. And then I started to learn about what was going on with Revelation 17, the mystery religion, the one world religion, and how all that's in, entwined in everything. And uh, I took both of those and put it together. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate. It was about 2020 when the Lord said, it's time for you to start talking to people about this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started my channel. And I have a heavy influence of taking those conspiracy theories I don't like talking about politics, but you got to do it. And then taking the mystery of religion and seeing how it all works together. So that's where I'm at now. Amen. Well, I knew, uh, you know, Tom was right when he said we would really have a kindred spirit because uh, I too, uh, uh, you know, follow uh, and have done a deep dive into conspiracy theories. Of course, I don't believe in conspiracy theories except the ones that are true, uh, which is most of them these days. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, conspiracy is just two or more people working together uh, to achieve some illegal or, or, or nefarious means. And the greatest conspiracy of all times is Satan working with human co-conspirators and evil celestial beings, demons and the like, to try to take over this world. And as soon as pe people, can, the sooner people can figure that out and, and awaken to that reality that is so clearly taught in Scripture, uh, then the more easily they will begin to piece together some of the dots on some of the earthly conspiracies as well. So, uh, well, that's fascinating. Yeah, like you, my father had a profound impact on my life and my theology and my thinking. He's still my biggest fan today. We talk uh, pretty often, and I know he's always listening, and uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, but it seems like the busier I get, the less time we have to interact. Uh, and he's down there in Texas, too, down there in the Holy Land. So, um, but, uh, well, that's fascinating. So, uh, and by the way, you mentioned NAR. We're going to have uh, Strat Goodhue, who was on this week, uh, next month, and about another month or so, we're going to have him back on and, and have a whole show about the New Apostolic Reformation and critiquing that. So um, that's something our listeners, if you're not familiar with that false teaching today, you can look forward to that. All right, so 
Trump tyranny and political theater. Now, full disclosure, uh, you got a couple of guys here that are probably preaching to the choir with each other, which is kind of nice because I get, especially on the subject of Trump, like you, I'm sure I get a lot of pushback. And I respect that. I respect people that have a different uh, viewpoint on uh, the political process. But should Christians kind of put all their eggs in the Trump basket? Let's start there. Uh, well, we'll go simple answer first. No, there's only one person that we should ever put all of our eggs in one basket. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's your simple, you know, Sunday school answer on that one. Um, but ultimately, no, um, I do not believe that he is. I believe in the the term of political theater. I believe that there is a, a show being put on. And I'll, I can kind of narrow it down to this. This is something that I've been juggling around for the past couple of months is where if you are cornered, you are forced into choosing between two, uh, two things, two uh, people, in this case, it would be two politicians, and both politicians are owned by the same group, you are not being given a choice, you're giving the you're being given the illusion of choice. And something that I've always talked about, and I, I get people who have pushed back on it, and I understand why, is there's no such thing as democracy. Um, it's something that gets thrown around a lot in media, politicians, even the church, you know, democracy, we need to protect democracy and, and all these types of things. But all democracy is, is again, that illusion of choice. And so if they're continuing to throw this word at you, that should be a red flag to go, okay, what's going on with this? And so they present two options, you're cornered into it, and you're given that. And so when we see what's going on, and I know you made a great point about this in your uh, Spirit of the Antichrist. I believe it's your first book about the Hegelian dialectic. It's about over the years, the, the decades that we've seen in this political system, about slowly moving the spectrum, political spectrum, where left continues to go further left and right continues to move right along with it. And I've used the, the uh, example of go back 40 years, 50 years, take a look at the Democratic Party then. They're a lot more conservative back then than they are now. And that's because they've moved that political spectrum without people realizing. And so they're getting people to compromise on their values. They're getting people to compromise on their own principles in order to just go with the best choice, illusion of choice that they've been given. And this term, it's, it's Trump. And everybody says, well, he subscribes to the Christian principles and he's about standing for the Christian Christian principles. Um, but the thing is, is I always look at the three check boxes of, is he pro-Israel, is he pro-life, and is he anti the alphabet or LGBTQ movement? Well, he doesn't check any of those boxes. The, he's tried to divide Israel. He wants the two-state solution. Um, he's not pro-life. I mean, he's even come out uh, saying, I mean, he made the right choice about giving abortion to states' rights. That's how it should be in the United States. But he's also saying, if we have to sacrifice some babies, if we have to abort babies in order to win the election and bring salvation back to America, that's not pro-life. You're basically saying it's okay to sacrifice if we win this election. And then pro-alphabet, he's come out and held gay galas at his own mansion in support of it, saying he's fighting and fighting hard for the gays. So it's, again, moving the spectrum, and they're getting these Christians to fall in line with supporting somebody who, again does not value the same thing that you do. Yeah, wow, that's such a great kind of opening statement. So many things there that I want to uh, dive into a little bit further. First of all, absolutely agree on the illusion of choice. I call it Calvinistic voting, you know, you, you know, right versus left, but they both lead to the to the slaughterhouse, so to speak. Uh, and uh, remember, you know, democracy is just two wolves and a, a lamb voting on what's for dinner. So uh, yep. we're not a democracy. We're, in theory, anyway, a constitutional republic. Now, one thing that I take a slightly different view on, and I'll just throw this out there for folks to think about, folks who followed our podcast for a while probably have heard me talk about this before, especially back when the, uh, the uh, abortion ruling uh, occurred uh, in June of a couple of years ago. But I don't think it's a states' rights issue at all. I think the Constitution is very clear in this country that uh, every human being has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and according to the 10th and 14th Amendments, only those things not specifically enshrined in the Constitution can be given to the states. And so by throwing this to the states, what Trump is essentially saying is that unborn children are not human beings that have inalienable rights, and therefore it's up to the states to make that decision. Well, that is exactly the opposite 
of what our country was founded on. Our country said every human being has unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and other things that were enshrined in the Bill of Rights as well. And so even though it sounds good, and certainly from a sort of a human perspective, uh, it, it might appear to be a step in the right direction. Uh, in reality, uh, what I would like is to have a president uh, or any kind of leader in American uh, government stand up and say, you know what, you know what, uh, unborn children are human beings, and they have the same rights that you and I have, and therefore it is unconstitutional to murder them. End of story, full stop. Uh, by throwing it to the states, essentially what we're doing is saying that each state can decide when, how, and how often to murder your baby and where. And it's just basically uh, kind of franchising out the abortion industry. And uh, praise God, in the short run, we do have some states that have taken the opportunity uh, to outlaw it. And, and that's a good thing, clearly, anytime we can save a life. But in the big picture, I think it sets, sends the wrong signal and comes at it from the wrong uh, direction, because we know biblically that people, things are getting worse and worse. And over time, and this is what I challenge people to think about, uh, do you think it's more likely that these so-called red states who are outlawing abortion are going to uh, kind of slip on that and end up you know, reverting? Or do you think it's more likely that the so-called blue states will see the light of day and outlaw it? Well, there's not going to be, California is not going to have a revival and suddenly say, oops, we made a mistake. Abortion should be illegal. New York's not going to do that. Colorado's not going to do that. Um, and so uh, I just feel like just in principle, uh, that's that's a mistake. But uh, let's go back to Trump for a moment. Um, and he's just sort of a metaphor in my mind. I'm not picking on Trump, but He's a metaphor for this false right-left paradigm, what, what you called political theater. Um, a lot of Christians either don't know, or if they do know, apparently don't care, that he is a leading proponent of LGBTQ. I mean, not just that he is, is uh, sort of uh, trying to take advantage of a situation and get some votes. When he was nominated, and I remember watching this live in 2016, at the Republican National Convention that summer, the night of the convention, which was Thursday night when he accepts the nomination, who did he choose to speak in prime time on the stage for all the world to see, for all these young Christian families with their young Christian children watching to see how the political process works, gathered around the TV, let's watch the RNC convention. Who did he pick to speak in prime time, just before he spoke, accepting the nomination. Well, he chose Peter Thiel, uh, who was, last I checked, number 16 on the list of most well-respected champions of LGBT. He's an out gay. In fact, he said in his speech at the convention that he's he's a Republican, and he's gay, and he's proud to be both. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we're dealing with. So my question to you, and then I'll let you kind of run with it here for a bit, why don't more Christians care about that? Why is that not a bigger deal with Christians? Um, I think it goes to something that, uh, honestly, that you said um, before we started recording was the cult of personality. Um, I think it's people get so wrapped up in the man and what specifically it's, this is a big psychological warfare thing, because if you have constant uh, br uh, br just this brash attack on somebody from the side that you don't like. So the left-wing media that constantly attacks Trump, well, it doesn't matter what Trump is going to stand for at that point. It, it doesn't matter what he's, he's doing. He's the lesser of the two evils. And so they get wrapped up in this, this belief that no matter what we, I think it's unfortunate that we have so many people out there. And I'm, I mean, pastors and Christian leaders and whatnot that, that, outright lie and say the bible says christians you have to vote mm. and i've heard some pastors out there say that uh that god's gonna say depart from me uh i never knew you because you didn't vote you hid your voting pen and i think that indoctrination into the christian church by these these christian leaders they've they've just been warped and and told brainwashed into believing that they have to do this and so i have to choose the left of two evils and I don't think that's what we should be doing at all. I don't think we should that we should be choosing evil. You know, I had somebody who who proposed a question. It says, "Well, it's true that uh, um, 
how did, how did they say it? it's true that uh trump isn't uh you know this big christian person or whatever but if we choose uh, if we don't vote or we choose the other side then we're allowing greater evil to take place and again i revert back to if they're owned by the same group you're voting for the same evil but if you don't vote for evil it's not you're now actively i should i should reword that let me reword that they said, if we don't vote for anything, then evil is going to take over the country. Well, the thing is, is if you do choose for the lesser of two evil, you are now actively choosing evil to take over the, the country. And so, again, it's this brainwash mentality of I have no choice. Even if he doesn't go against the principles, I'm this is the guy. And I think a lot of it has to do with the mindset that this world is entering into now of that Antichrist mindset. I'm not calling Trump the Antichrist. Somebody's going to take that out of context. They always do. <laughs> they always do. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's the they're, the minds of the world is preparing to accept this leader that's going to come in and fix things. Whether it's left or right, they've, they've got this mentality that somebody is going to come in. And so they're wrapped up in the cult of personality and Christians actively lie to themselves or choose not to uh, educate themselves. Or the other one that I've seen is a lot of people, right wing, even the prophecy community, Christian churches, they refuse to report on anything that is uh, a opposition to the side that we're supposed to align with. And so um, whether they're just not educated themselves or they're actively hiding things, it's still a deception. And as we know, in Matthew 24, I mean, Jesus Christ, he started off the, the whole thing when they ask him, what's the end of the age going to look like? Take heed, do not be deceived that we should understand that if he starts out with that, then that is obviously something we should be paying attention to. So I think a lot of it is ignorance. A lot of it is they're being lied to. And a lot of it is, is they're lying to themselves because of the cult of personality that they've been presented. Yeah, absolutely. Deception is going to get worse and worse. Second Timothy 3.13. And you're right, Jesus, speaking of that generation that will be alive right before uh, he returns to establish his kingdom, repeatedly cautions against deception uh, in the Olivet Discourse there. Uh, so let's go back to lesser of two evils. Um, you know, I, I love uh, how you say when both candidates are owned by the same entity, then really it's, you know, your doesn't really matter. It's the illusion that, that there's a difference. Um, I, you know, I like to make sort of analytical type arguments. I, I spent 12 years in academics and sort of cut my teeth on uh, doing a research and things. And I, I learned, I, it wasn't always this way, but I learned and it's still learning because it's a lifelong process, uh, you know, how to, how to think critically and to be fair to, to other views and just to kind of take arguments to their logical extreme. I I remember I used to teach a course on logical fallacies, which really taught me a lot about it. I'd never, you know, never understood. There were so many logical fallacies and what they all were. And now I can, I can, they kind of resonate with me and I, I pick them, pick up, pick up on them. But to me, if you take that principle of the lesser of two evils, and, and like you said, you know, someone will say, well, <clears throat> you know, if I, <clears throat> if I vote for Trump, at least I'm not voting for someone that's that evil, you know, right? Well, if you take that principle to its logical extreme, you know, we always have to vote for the lesser of two evils. Uh, suppose we get to the day where you've got one candidate, say the Democrat, who believes that all children ages 10 and younger should be slaughtered or sacrificed to Moloch. Um, but the other candidate says, no, 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 that's crazy. I think only six-year-olds and younger should be slaughtered and sacrificed to Moloch. Now, would Christians vote for one of those two candidates? I certainly hope not. And I think people are probably going, well, that's a ridiculous, you know, uh, illustration. Well, it makes the point that it's all a matter of degree. How evil is too evil before you can throw your support behind it? So people need to realize when you say lesser of two evils, it's still evil. I wrote an article back during uh, in 2012, a long time ago. In fact, I took some flack for it from some, prophecy, some of my prophecy colleagues back when Romney was running against uh, Obama. And I wrote, I said, I called it the evil of two lessers. And, and it made the case why you shouldn't vote for Romney. And uh, similar to Trump these days, a Romney was pro-LGBT. He was very pro-abortion. In fact, in the article, I linked to an old video that was out there of him uh, doing a debate when he was running for some office in Massachusetts. It wasn't governor. 
but uh, he was just debating a bill that was coming up, uh, you know, in, in Massachusetts that would allow 14-year-old girls to get abortions without parental consent. And I played this video of him, and he was emphatic. He said, I don't care how old the child is. They ought to be able to get an abortion without parental consent. And boy, people just, you know, read me the riot act. Um, but, you know, that's that's the reality of it. Uh, guys like Romney and Trump. Trump, as I state in my second uh, Spirit of the Antichrist book, had changed party, I think it's nine, seven or eight or nine times uh, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, whatever's politically expedient. Uh, so I think the lesser of two evils is a fallacy. Um, you know, if you believe in the candidate and you believe he's the best candidate for America and you believe he's the best biblically, you know, best candidate with a biblical worldview, vote for it. That's your prerogative and that's between you and the Lord. But don't vote for him because he's not Hillary. I mean, that's not a reason to vote or he's not Obama. So therefore, I'm going to vote for him. Um, I, you know, you're right. I, I, you really, I think, d describe well the dynamic there. The enemy of my enemy really becomes my friend. And so when the liberal, progressive, left-wing media attacks Trump, we go, well, he must be doing something good. So I'm going to I'm going to support him. Well, I think that's naive. It, it shows a, a lack of regard for the complexity of of the conspiracy, the lies upon lies, you know, they they put out misinformation and disinformation, and, and it's it's not as simple as right, wrong, black, white, that that kind of thing. Um, we've talked a lot about voting already and some of the principles about that. Um, do you think these days our vote really even counts at the presidential level? Um, simple answer, I do not. Um, this is something that I've I've looked at for a long time. Um, I went back. I, I've I've gone back way in history, but the the area that I really focused on up until this point uh, went back to the days of Woodrow Wilson, and we take a look at what happened during the the World War One and how the the uh, uh, the UN and everything was formed, and it was. You see the the Rockefellers, um, along with a guy by the name of uh, Baruch, um, and a couple other ones who uh, they came together and they basically said, "We will give you this presidency if you just go along with these things that we want to get involved." And one of those things was if a war happened, they just put it kind of in a question type of way, like if a what if if a war happened to begin a world war happen to begin in, in uh, the Europe, uh, European area and starts to expand and stuff, then we want you to do these things and all this stuff. And sure enough, uh, some people would call them prophets. I just call them um, puppeteers. They they just orchestrated these things along with like Carnegie Endowment and uh, a bunch of other ones as well. And he was handed the presidency because he was going to do the things that they wanted him to do. And then when they were done with him, they passed them along and then they brought in the next guy and they brought in the next guy and, and it just continued down the road. And my thing is, is if it was happening back then, how on earth did it ever stop from happening today? I mean, it's just, I guess it's kind of the same thing where, you know, people have the question about, well, is the, if Trump gets in, then uh, the prophecies, they're going to slow down. He's going to pause all these things and stuff like that. And I sit there and go, so you're telling me Trump has more power than God and he's going to put a hold on the prophecies. It's, this is birth pains. You can't, uh, when a child is on the way, as it, as the scripture tells us that this is what's happening now, you can't just pause it and tell the baby to stop coming. It's going to can continue to come. And the usual pushback that I get on that has to do with, uh, well, you're telling, uh, God used Trump. I'm not denying that God used Trump, but you never hear them say God used Biden. God mm -hmm. used Obama. God used Bush. God used all these other guys too. You never hear them say that argument because they don't want to admit that. But the fact is, is every president that we've had put in place, God has used that person. But again, getting back to the original question, no, um, I, I don't call them elections anymore. I call them selections. Um, again, two candidates that you are cornered into choosing, you're given the illusion of choice. That means they control both and it doesn't really matter at that point. So no, I don't think voting on the presidential level or even to a, a certain extent, Senate and House and stuff, even that. That's why I, I I I don't tell people not to vote, but I heavily say, if you're not sure, 
at least vote on the local level because I believe that you still have somewhat of a voice when it comes to mayor and city council and school board and stuff. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I know I'm saying that a lot, but it is nice to have someone who really is not afraid to speak out on those issues because let's face it, we've been taught for so long, especially if you grew up in a conservative Christian, you know, Baptist type environment, as I did, that voting is your moral duty and that it's basically sinful if you don't vote. Uh, and, uh, and and I agree completely. I think there are plenty of places that we should vote. We can vote on local referendums. We can vote on school board issues. We can vote on our HOA issues. Plenty of places where our vote still counts. But uh, I just don't believe in pretend voting because I'm not a child. I don't play pretend games anymore. Uh, and so, uh, I, you know, I think that's clear. Yeah, Woodrow Wilson, of course, gave us the Fed, among other mm -hmm. things, and and uh, the privately owned Federal Reserve and the income tax and some of these other things. Yeah, he was definitely a pawn. And as you said, it's much easier now to manipulate the vote with digital vote tabulation machines than it was back then. So, you know, vote rigging is certainly nothing new. There's always been corruption. It just mm -hmm. became easier and easier to do it so that now, you know, they announce who they have selected to be president. Uh, and we dutifully sit back and assume that that was actually the outcome of the, of the vote count. Uh, I think 2020 awakened a lot of people to the reality of vote, you know, voter fraud. Uh, and yet, amazingly, here we are four years later, and many Christians are dutifully lining back up and nothing has changed, you know. Um, I want to read off some quotes here. And I'm doing this uh, to make a point for our listeners, because when I first you know, looked into this, it really stuck with me and resonated uh, with me. Uh, and, and this goes to the point of lesser of two evils, the right-left paradigm, that Republicans are good people and Democrats are bad people and so forth. And we would, and, and as you said, we would never, we never hear people say, well, you know, that was a good decision for Obama, you know. Uh, I, I try to be objective. I've given credit where credit's due. Some of the things that that happened during Trump's uh, first term were good, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, but but there were also good things that happened in other, uh, you know, democratic terms. Is it true that generally speaking, from a Christian worldview, the the controllers, the the puppeteers, tend to throw more bones to us that we like with a Republican in office than with a Democrat? Absolutely. Am, am I a friend and supporter of Obama or Clinton or any of these? Absolutely not. But let's be let's be fair about it. Let's be objective. So uh, tell me if you agree with these with these quotes. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and I am redeemed through him. Yep. Agree with that? Yeah, me too. Yep. Amen. So that makes us President Barack Obama fans, because that's what he said. Uh, do you agree with this? The Bible is the authoritative word of God and contains all truth. Yep, absolutely. You do? Really? Then you must be a Bill Clinton fan, because that's what I guess so. Bill Clinton said. Uh, <laughs> quote, the Bible was and remains the biggest influence on my thinking. I was raised reading it, memorizing passages from it, and being guided by it. I still find it a source of wisdom, comfort, and encouragement. Sounds pretty yep. good, right? Yep. Yeah, well, that was Hillary Clinton. Uh, how about this one? Um, my favorite word is the word, capital W, and that is everything. It says it all for us, and you know the biblical reference, the gospel reference of the word. We have to give voice to what that means in terms of public policy and keeping the values of the word, capital W. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, that yeah, was, I'm on board. Yeah, that was Nancy Pelosi. Um, and uh, let's do one more here. Uh, Jesus Christ is the human embodiment of God wants us to do. Uh, a little more vague, but still, I, I would agree with that in general. Uh, that's you could take all. that in a weird direction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you could. Yeah, yeah, with the embodied AI and all of that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's he is more than that, but he's definitely the human embodiment of, of of God, and that was, of course, was President Joe Biden. What's the point? The point is, we love to cherry pick quotes, and and we have we have sort of become tunnel visioned to that you know, Republicans can do no wrong and Democrats can, uh, you know, can do no right. Um, I love Leo Holman's re most recent article 
that uh, where he talks about basically this is the end of the Republican Party. I mean, the, the things are, you know, we're we're getting to the point now where they can't pull one over on us anymore. You know, the people are are realizing more and more that this uh, system is is rigged and controlled, and it's a kind of a false two party system. Uh, so I would encourage folks to check out. Um, my my second volume, Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume Two, that has a whole chapter, Chapter Seven, on uh, fake elections and the history of uh, election rigging and so forth. So, again, just to kind of put a bow on this part of the discussion, uh, you know, should we vote? I think you answered that, but kind of give us your perspective again. Should we vote? I think it is something that everybody should be uh, should do according to what the lord leads them to do um i think you know you go back against several decades ago voting used to be a a personal thing it wasn't something that you just announced to everybody you you didn't go around it's like it's like you never ask a woman her age well back then it was you never ask who you voted for because it was a it was a private thing now it's you know it's your job to go out there well are you voting you have to tell me who you're voting for and we have these leaders out there that are basically you know trying to move direct their flocks in the way of voting so i think it should be absolutely something that whatever the lord leads you to do that's what you should do but i think you should make it your mission especially in these times to make sure that you're well informed on all the things, even the ones, the information that they, the other, your own side doesn't want you to know about. So make sure you're informed and let the Lord lead you on that matter. Yeah, well said. And and again, I don't uh, disrespect anybody who still believes that you know voting is sacrosanct and you should do it. That praise God. I I hope you're right. Uh, I just uh, my research leads me down a different path, and I just. I, I, for me, Zach, by the way, I'm, I'm not a very good host. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Zach from the Wretched Watchman. Uh, you can find him on YouTube at Wretched Watchman. Um, uh, Zach, as when I first woke up, my wife and I, uh, almost 20 years ago now, one of the biggest feelings I had to wrestle with was shame and guilt for allowing myself to be so duped because, you know, I was a card carrying right wing Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Republican Party, you know, kind of guy and bought it all hook, line and sinker. And when I realized I'd been deceived about so many things, including 9-11, I just became angry. And so I just really am sensitive to being duped or being played. And I, I just don't like this notion of, especially as we saw it in 2020, you know, dutifully mailing in my ballot or going to a polling place and casting a vote and then sitting back uh, with popcorn and a, a Coke and watching the returns come in and then can't wait till CNN or Fox News tells me who my next president is as if they really have counted the votes. I just, I don't like being played. And so for me, it's very hard. It's a personal decision. But I get it. I get that people are in a journey. And my wife often reminds me, look, there was a time when you weren't awake. So don't be so hard on the people that are still kind of feeling their way, uh, their way through it. Um, you know, uh, another great uh, quote here, you know, you talked about people in this sort of social media culture telling everybody who they voted for. It's just like we've sort of crossed a threshold some years ago with social media that nothing's private anymore. You just kind of bear your whole life to everybody. But uh, it wasn't always that way. Um, you know, I, I remember a quote that uh, uh, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, uh, who, again, people revere as a conservative like they do Reagan, but if they knew the whole story about the British monarchy and Reagan, for that matter, uh, yep. it, it would shock a lot of people. But she famously quipped, quote, power is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't. <laughs> and I think that's, uh, <laughs> you know, if you have to tell people you've got power, uh, you know, does it, you know, do you really have it? That's the question. Um, let's talk for a bit about the church and the church's role in whether wittingly or I believe in some cases very intentionally, uh, I think there are controlled agents and controlled churches out there, but whether wittingly or not, advancing this false narrative uh, of Romans 13 and the sense that Christians have to obey the government at all costs. What's your take on that? Um, I think they have the wrong idea of the law of the land, at least here in the United States. Um, because again, you look at Romans, it says, well, obey your, your leaders. Well, here in the United States, our leaders, the law of the land is the constitution and we, the people. And so it's, 
it's our job to tell them what to do. So we are technically the leaders on that. So just because they're sitting up there and they're getting paid a, an ungodly amount of money that they shouldn't be doing for the role that they're playing and they wear suits and they, and everybody reveres them in some type of way. And they, they, everybody thinks that, Oh, they're the powerful ones there. And you'll notice that's another psychological thing in the media. They're now called lawmakers now, as opposed to what they were before. It's, it's trying to get, society to accept them as the ones in control that can make all these things well it's they've given the people have just given them the 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 power that they actually are the ones that hold so it should be up to the people it should be up to the constitution and and if anything goes against the constitution um or you know the law of the land the bill of rights and everything then it's not valid and we have every right to uh ignore it in that type of way so it's the same thing like when 2020 happened and the uh the mandates came rolling down everybody just followed in line because that's what the leader told them that they had to do well that was not at all how it was supposed to go and mandates is not a law either so it's just training the people getting the sheep to follow along with a false structure of power in this country that doesn't actually exist kind of like the word democracy it's just an illusion so that's my take on it yeah, I, I agree completely. Uh, you know, uh, by the way, Romans 13 doesn't use the word obey. It uses the word submit, big difference. Uh, and it all same word that's used of wives submitting to their husbands and children submitting to their parents and uh, Christians submitting to one another. Uh, and so does that mean that a wife has to submit to her husband at all costs, no matter what, even if she's being beaten? Of course not. Uh, do we have to submit to other Christians, even if they're abusing and taking advantage of us? Of course not. The whole premise of Romans 13 is this, to the extent that the government is God's divine instrument and, and is doing what God's divine design is for governments to do, then yeah, it works well when we follow the government. But when a government steps outside of that and goes rogue and is actually advancing ungodly, tyrannical agendas, then we are absolutely under no obligation. Uh, and frankly, the whole notion that Christians have to obey their government uh, at all costs is a is a distinctly American Western concept. I mean, Christians mm -hmm. in in North Korea or China don't don't you know sit around their living room talking about Romans thirteen and how they have to obey their government. They 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 understand it. They get that they obey God first, and they're trying their best to lie and deceive their government uh, because they don't want to be found out. I mean, they, you know, that's, that gets into a whole other issue of the definition of a lie, which I've written about that. But uh, is it, if, if the, uh, if the government comes knocking and wants to put you on the train, are you sinning against a holy God by not telling them that you've hidden your children in a basement, you know, secret hideaway or hiding in the closet? I mean, that's silly. Uh, and mm -hmm. I actually have talked to Christians in the academic world that say, that would be a sin that you should just let them go. And if the, if God wants to protect them, he'll protect them. I, I don't believe so. I mean, that so many examples we could think of in, in scripture. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point you made. I had not thought about it, how that they used to be called representatives, according to mm -hmm. the constitution. Now they're called lawmakers, right? Uh, word games, word games, conditioning, conditioning. Um, yep. One more point uh, on the, you know, elections and stuff to, to, to kind of throw out there for food for thought one of the arguments that you hear is, well, we've got to vote for one of the two party systems because otherwise we're just throwing our vote away, right? You know, it, it, they're the only ones that are electable, so we just have to pick the lesser of two evils. Well, I'm reminded of the story of when Israel uh, was ready for the next king after Saul. And remember, Samuel went to talk to David's uh, father, Jesse, and he said, hey, I, you know, show me your sons. I want to see who the next king's going to be. And he parades all of these strong, strapping, well-suited, you know, big men in front of him. And uh, Samuel says, nope, none of these are the ones. You got anybody else? And Jesse says, well, I got this scrawny little shepherd boy way out in the field shoveling sheep dung, you know, but surely he's not the one. And, and you know the story. Samuel said, that's God's man, right? So, you know, just because conventionally we think, you know, oh, this person could never get elected, uh, that's exactly what they want us to think, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. So how deep, let's shift gears now in, we're talking with Zach from the Wretched Watchman, and we're talking about Trump, tyranny, uh, and political theater. Um, how deep does the satanic influence I mean, I mean, I mean, actual satanic Luciferian influence run 
inside the beltway of Washington, D.C. from your uh, perspective in research? Um, I think it goes pretty deep because, I mean, you look at, I think having an idea of the structure, the, the power structure out there, because um, a lot of people think Washington has like this incredible power, which I'm not saying that it doesn't. Um, but ultimately, and, and I always go back to this cartoon, uh, this little comic strip, I don't know if you've ever seen it, where it shows the big bird on top, and then there's another rung where there's a couple more birds and there's some bird crap. On the, and then you go further down and there's more birds, but they're just absolutely covered type of thing. <laughs> Washington's at the bottom. They're absolutely covered, in my opinion. And it's just <laughs> there's this there's this power level that I think uh, people have got to understand. And so Washington's just another ligament, another uh, aperture of the, the body that they're trying to do with their Luciferian standard. And I personally believe um, that those who are controlling these organizations like Washington and, you know, the U.N. and, and all that stuff, um, they are. I, th I believe that de demonic presence, even possibly Satan is whispering into the ears of these people to direct mm -hmm. them the way that they want to go. And I think that obviously, well, I don't think I know because the Bible tells me that God's in control of all these things. And so he's using even them to make sure that the prophecy that has already happened for him, I think that's an important thing to understand is God sits above time. So these things have already happened for him. And that's why we have the word that tells us what's going to happen. Uh, but I believe that he uses these people to make that make that stuff happen. But as far as Washington, I think it goes deep. That's why I think when it comes to presidents and even Senate and and uh the house and and you know all these arms uh branches that they have and stuff they're they're fully wrapped up in the luciferian uh agenda do i think every single person in there is no i don't think so i think the majority is though i will stand on that um and they are again they're just given a script to read they may not even know what the final agenda is but they're either getting paid very well or they've got their life or blackmail on the line that they can't uh, go against what they want to do. That's the best way to, to look at that is you look at some of the bills that come through um, that absolutely have to happen. Things like the Patriot Act or even the CARES Act, which people don't want to realize that the CARES Act was actually um, introduced in January of 2019 before 2020 even happened this was a bill that was meant for 2020 so it was before all that stuff even happened you can look into crimson contagion which trump was running at the beginning of 2019 so they knew it was coming and he was helping coordinate all that stuff for event 201 and then 2020 when it finally happened well that bill had to happen and so it was introduced very early nobody had any idea what was going on it got put on hold later that summer and then when they were ready for it to come through it was almost unanimously unanimously voted for Mm -hmm. Both right and left voted for it, which plummeted us in the debt. And there's something hidden in there that people don't realize. There's $400 million for mail-in ba ballot voting in that bill as well, which mm -hmm. Trump, you can find the video, was laughingly signing and smiling to the cameras when he did. He knew what was in there. And so, again, it's you've got the Luciferian agenda that God is using, and it's passed down to these people who just have scripts and they just follow the script because their measly little life is on the line if they don't. So I think it runs very, very deep. Yeah. So I'll come back to that in a second, but it's funny you mentioned about God being outside time because I was on the Stand Up For The Truth this morning, uh, the, the live radio show, and we talked about that very thing. It, it really, I know it might sound too simplistic for some people who struggle with the sort of the sovereignty free will debate and the why God allows suffering and all this kind of stuff. But it really is true that even though in time, space, and matter, we find ourselves facing the inequities of life and the tragedies and the unfairness and all of the hurts and, and, and harms and so forth, uh, from God's perspective, He exists outside of time in the eternal now. And when we shake our, shake our fist at heaven and say, why God, or when God, when are you going to bring justice? When are you going to stop this evil? Why do so many horrific people get off scot-free? God is up there going, I've already done it. I've already judged them. They're already in the lake of fire. I mean, mm -hmm. we just don't see it yet. So, uh, you know, I want to be clear, something you said, you know, much earlier in the program, which I couldn't agree more, is that, yes, God uses Trump, and yes, God uses, you know, Biden, and, and God uses them all the same way we read in Scripture that he used Ahab and Jezebel. He used 
you know, Babylon and Persia and Egypt and Assyria and all of these. God is God. Nothing can contravene God's sovereignty. Uh, we're not talking about that. What we're saying is that in this realm of uh, of time, space, and matter, in this world where the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one, 1 John 5, 19, how do we navigate? How do, how do we, you know, do we just, you know, go along uh, to get along and and and, or do we are we supposed to be lights in this perverse generation, as Paul says, and 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 standing up for what's different? Uh, yeah, no question on the Patriot Act that was written well in advance of 9/11. There's no way they could have whatever it was 1,500 page document thrown <laughs> together as quickly as they did. So this is their pattern. They get these things, uh, you know, ahead of time and. And but but back to you know inside the beltway. Oh, and by the way, I was going to ask you: Do you think the the Supreme Court is also a part of this? The I'm sorry, say that again. The Supreme Court. I think they play a role. Um, I certainly do, especially since you look at some of the conservative quote unquote judges that Trump put in there. If you look into their background, Amy Coney Barrett is was wrapped up in a seriously devilish cult. Mm -hmm. um, and she's a charismatic Catholic. And so clearly whatever is guiding her moral compass is not of God. So yeah, I do believe that the Supreme Court is definitely, especially since they unanimously voted, you know, Trump's going through all the legal stuff. Well, yeah. no, he can go for president. Yeah. I should tell you everything. Yeah, absolutely. And, and back to, in the election, when it was clearly documented, empirically provable fraud, they basically said, "Nope, nothing to see her move along." I mean, that that that's that's pretty clear. But yeah, I, I I absolutely agree. The Supreme Court is controlled, and to me, I think the devil is just one of the biggest uh, sort of laughable moments for him when he was high fiving with his evil celestial beings was when the so called supermajority on the Supreme Court, the six to three, you know, was finally able to, as they convinced conservatives, overturn Roe v. Wade with the Dodds mm -hmm. decision, when really all they did was enshrine the fact that unborn children do not have constitutional rights. Because if they had constitutional rights, you can't throw that to the states. Uh, the states cannot do anything that violates the U.S. Constitution. So if they had constitutional rights, which they do, uh, but the Supreme Court said they didn't, uh, they would not have been able to throw it to the states. So it's just, it's classic where... You, you, you. Know, the conventional narrative is we finally got enough conservatives to overturn Roe v. Wade. Which, by the way, even though the supermajority is supposedly six to three, that vote was only five to four. So even there, we barely got by in conventional thought. Um, in reality, it was just the opposite. And, and Satan really does masquerade as an angel of light. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about the satanic uh, aspect in, in Lucifer. So we get in, in Washington, we get that. Uh, there's corruption, there's all kinds of immorality, there's payoffs, there's money, greed, you know, all, I mean, it's a cesspool, no doubt. But what I'm asking about is how deep do the tentacles of of Satanism really go? Like with the whole Pizzagate thing and, and you know, the, the satanic ritual abuse and, you know, the kinds of things that we, that we hear, if you look at the alternative media, you never hear about in the mainstream media. Um, do you think that's that's actually going on there? I do. I do. Um, this was about a year, year and a half ago. I did a an extensive dive. Who it's still still you, you can't unsee some things, let's just say. And I did an extensive dive when it comes to the trafficking and the child pedophilia and mm -hmm. and all those things. And the stuff that I saw, I mean, a lot of these people, they they put it on display, they flaunt it, they wear certain articles of clothing as not as a, you know, like a sign of, well, I'm just, I'm in the club type of thing. It's, it's almost like the Masons, you know, they flaunt it. It's like, look at what I have done. And they're proud of what they, what they do. So when it comes to pizza gate, um, I saw the snuff film of frazzle drip. I actually saw that thing, but this was before the AI takeover um, that was happening. And yeah, they, they flaunt, they, they host these parties together. The people that they put, um, uh, each other in with contact um one of them is um can't pronounce her name the uh mariana abraham abraham a a a abram abraham yeah i know you're a abranova or something yeah like that. that that witch lady or yeah. yeah but she's she's hosted the parties where you know you eat 
food off of a live body, but there's actual blood on the body. And you see politicians, you see celebrities in, in Hollywood, in the entertainment industry. Um, you see some of these people that are there. I mean, and these pictures, they're not just, oh, it, that wouldn't happen to slip out. No, they're putting it out there to tell people. Kind of like, um, I'm sure you saw the video of that ritual that was being done at CERN uh, not yes. too long ago. Yeah, it's That didn't just slip out. They purposely put that out there. And again, when you look into the like the Luciferian agenda, the, the handbook, you know, it's always the predictive programming and stuff. Why do they tell us what they're going to do? Why, why do they allow us to see the stuff going on there? Well, I... From what I have seen, a lot of it has to do with, you know, uh, it's a Satan's an imitator. He likes to twist things. And so it's his own twist on, well, we warned you guys. And so we're passing the blame. It's now on you. The blood is on your hands uh, type of thing. You know, it's as watchmen, it's our job to warn people. If we don't, then it's on our hands. Well, Satan has twisted that. And it's the same way they're telling you. It's like, hey, this is our daddy. We're, we're children of, of the devil here. And so we're doing his thing and we're going to show it to you. Now we don't get to see everything, which praise the Lord that we don't guys, mm. trust me. Mm. I've only seen a very small portion of it. You do not want, I don't want to see the rest of it personally. I had to stop when I was diving into that. I just couldn't handle it, but mm. it's, it's absolutely real and they flaunt it. And you can see some of the, the again, the either it's paintings or the clothing or pins or stuff that they wear where it's saying, Hey, look at what I did and I'm proud of it. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I think it is there. No, boy, no question. Yeah. I don't know if you, I'm sure you did. You, you saw out of shadows that documentary, but it's got yeah. some, a, a good section in there where that one reporter is documenting and showing that a lot of the code language from the Podesta emails that gave rise to the whole Pizzagate scandal uh, are actually used across the country in uh, sex abuse cases and admitted in court, and it's an open secret. It's known. It's documented evidence accepted in court that these code words mean this and and this and this. And yet, when we saw those occur in the Podesta emails, uh, you know, the the media just brushed it all aside as a alleged you know conspiracy and so forth. Um, but yeah, that let's talk about that credo that the satanic credo that they got to tell you what they're going to do, and it's usually in secret, coded, not necessarily coded, but subtle uh ways through media and movies and television shows that you wouldn't really catch it at the time but looking back you go oh this was quite a coincidence um have you uh have you seen some of the uh kind of the uh, prefiguring of these events like uh, oklahoma city bombing and the 9-11 all the advance notice about 9-11 i'm sure you have yeah yeah, yeah, 9-11 was a huge one. Uh, anything from children's cartoons back from the 80s and 90s, that stuff was was right there, especially, I think it was a Super Friends episode from 87. Hmm. I could be wrong about the date. I'm terrible with dates. Yeah. I don't do numbers. But yeah, it was a Super Friends episode where you see this dude come out. It was a pyramid and he shot a laser at the Twin Towers and blew them up. And it's <laughs> it's like... And that's just on a heap of other stuff. The Simpsons, you know, they're notorious for it, which if you want to dive into the Matt Groening trail, you can. He's definitely all wrapped up in that stuff as well. But there's a reason why Simpsons always get stuff right, guys. Yeah. Because uh, he he knows kind of, I'll say it, kind of like Alex Jones. There's a reason why he knows all this stuff that nobody else does because he's wrapped up in it. So it's, yeah, it's 9-11, yeah. Oklahoma, all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the OKC one was... Uh... You know, the the book that uh, Frank Keating's brother came out with six months before the bombing, uh, where, and you can still buy it on Amazon. First of all, uh, Keating, who had just become governor of Oklahoma when this happened, came out of the FBI. So I really believe he was a plant. But then, you know, his brother publishes a novel. I think it was called The Last Jihad. And the whole, <clears throat> the whole plot of the... Uh, the novel is that a, a domestic terrorist uh, plans bombs a federal building in Oklahoma City. Uh, his name is Thomas McVeigh in the book. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up. No. And then he gets caught when his when a friend or a co-conspirator co of his is pulled over for having by a Oklahoma State trooper because he has a tail light out, which is exactly what happened six months later in the real deal. So, um, but back to the the Luciferian influence and the, just the wanton Satanism. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the there are several Hollywood movies out there that really sort of kind of tell you in plain sight what they're doing. One of those was Eyes Wide Shut, uh, yep. Stanley Kubrick's final film. You know, Kubrick, 
uh, he, he's, he's a, a big part of, you know, kind of giving us a peek behind the Luciferian curtain. Uh, all of his movies uh, kind of tell us something for those who have, you know, who are discerning enough to see it. Dr. Strangelove uh, comedically exposes the risks and realities of nuclear war. Of course, A Clockwork Orange uh, paints a violent picture of, uh, of dystopian Britain. The Shining. <laughs> Uh, we could talk about some of the secret coded messages in there about one of the greatest lies of all time. Um, Full Metal Jacket exposes the dark themes of uh, military brainwashing. And then, of course, Eyes Wide Shut, which was re which was released posthumously after he died, unveils the dark underworld of satanic ritual abuse in Hollywood. And I can't find the clip, but I, I remember specifically watching a clip uh, sometime, one time that uh, the star, let's see, the, the woman in... Uh, eyes wide shut. Um, I can uh, see her. Yeah, me too. She, uh, anyway, Nicole Kidman. Yeah, Nicole, Nicole Kidman. Kidman. Thank you. Uh, and I realize she's from Australia, but I saw a clip of her doing an interview one time, and she talked about openly how it was easy for her to play the role in that movie because she had experienced satanic ritual abuse as a child. Uh, so that just tells you what Hollywood's all about. But you know, other glimpses into that dark underworld uh, as you mentioned kind of the just the, the artwork and all kinds of the comic books and things but we've got bohemian grove we know what goes on there um and just as this woman that you talked about that has these meals where you kind of feign eating dead bodies uh in bohemian grove they sacrifice a child now it's allegedly an effigy. We hope it's an effigy. No one's gotten close enough to really get a clear picture of it. Uh, Alex Jones snuck in there one time posing as a male prostitute and was able to get some grainy footage, but still we can't tell exactly what's on that altar that they're burning. Um, but And these are guys like Reagan and Nixon and Kissinger and world leaders and Walter Cronkite and people like that attending these ceremonies. And then uh, here in our own state in Denver years ago, uh, they used to have some murals on the baggage claim level uh, that were just satanic to the core, depicting children being killed. And uh, I took pictures of them, still have them. They've since taken them down because of the public outcry, but it was an in-your-face open admission to, you know, what they're planning to do uh, to do someday. Um, all right, we're about out of time, time but I want to close with one more topic just to get your take on, and that is uh, Wendy and I went out last night and saw Civil War, the Alex Garland uh, movie that was much ballyhooed. Uh, personally, I thought it was you know not that well done. It was like there was zero plot. It was just one scene after another of Americans killing each other. I think clear conditioning. Uh, there were moments in these little isolated scenes where you know the acting was pretty good and the scene was good, but you know you're left kind of wondering what's the plot? It ne they never really clearly explained who the antagonists were, who the protagonists were, and where this thing is heading, except that it ends with the, the Western forces storming the Oval Office and killing the president uh, in this civil war. Um, what are you hearing about it? And do you agree that it's uh, mainly just conditioning us for what's coming down the pike? And do you feel like we are on the brink of some type of civil unrest? Um, I think it's interesting. Um, I'll, I'll back it up one because I think it's kind of a unspoken sequel of the Leave the World Behind movie that came out on Netflix earlier. And I think the idea of where there's no clear pro, uh, antagonist and protagonist, and I haven't seen it yet, but I've kind of read some stuff on it. I did a video when the trailer first came out. Um, but it's interesting because part of that three stage maneuver in Leave the World Behind has to do with making it so there's no clear cut enemy. And it's just mass chaos that happens. And then the third and final step is <clears throat> it's just civil war. The entire country breaks down. And then the next movie comes out is civil war where there's no clear enemy. It's all confusion and everybody's just fighting everybody trying to, you know, survival of the fittest type of thing. And then they're just going for whatever their leaders are telling them to go for. So the Western forces, which that always confused me in the trailer. How does, how is, uh, Texas and California are going to align on that. I know <laughs> that was again. I th I think that could be part of it. Confusion because a lot of us were going like, "Huh? How does that make sense?" So I think <laughs> I think that goes right along with it, whether they were aiming for that or not. Um, but as far as do I think something is coming? How I read scripture and how I look at it in the prophetic event, 
America isn't mentioned. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're just completely wiped off the planet. Like people think, oh, we're going to get 500 nukes dropped on us. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think we're going to become so insignificant. We're going to not be, you know, worth mentioning in scripture. So we have to collapse in some type of way. Um, I, I believe it's my opinion, at least, you know, it changes on the daily because as we see things unfold, um, that, it's going to be the financial collapse that's going to cause outright chaos. And we know the fi global financial chaos, uh, collapse has to happen in order for them to bring in a new system. You have to destroy what's there to bring in the new one. And so when that happens, I think that's when it's just going to be a free for all. And this country is going to tear each other apart, especially since we've been invaded on the inside. Um, I'm sure everybody knows about what's going on with the Chinese and the Muslims, as well as the South Americans in here as well. So it's just, I think that's what's going to happen to America. And I I personally don't believe that that's going to happen until the rapture. I think the rapture is going to be the key for that. Yeah. So that's my opinion on that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's, they're, they're going to foment. Chaos. I think it's a multi-pronged attack for economic uh, and, and many other things, but yeah, that, that movie, I, it's like, I never could figure out whose side I was on. And I think that maybe was that's a good point. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I guess. I mean, at the end when they're storming into the oval office, I'm going, well, I think I want them to kill the president, but I'm not sure if I really do. Um, I mean, I can't remember whose side I'm on. It's just it, the whole thing was one scene after another. And one of the real eerie things about it was every time j just the, the flippant nature of killing other citizens. I mean, indiscriminately, they would just, you know, kill and then laugh about it. And it's just like. It, it really, I think there were certain scenes in the movie that were surreal, and and I could see that being what happens at some point in this country. Never mind, you know, the overall plot, which there really wasn't much of one, and never mind who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. Just the the concept of the indiscriminate lack of concern for for human life. I think that's that's one of the things they were really going for there. So, uh, and yeah, in terms of tearing down America, the Hegelian dialectic, you said it earlier, it's order out of chaos. They've got to destroy in order to build back as part of the one world system. Well, we could go on and on. I love talking about this stuff. You are just, uh, just a great Great, uh, knowledgeable about all this stuff. Great guy to talk to. We'll definitely have to do this again uh, because so much more ground we could cover. But thanks for giving of your time and and I uh, hope we've given some folks uh, some food for thought. You know, again, people may not always agree on everything. That's fine. Uh, we could be wrong on some things. That's fine. But the bottom line is uh, Satan is hard at work here conspiring with human agents and demons to try to, to, to take over this world. So with that, I want to close by reminding people, if you are listening to this and you're not certain if you're going to spend eternity in heaven, uh, that's priority number one. The, you know, the Bible says we're all sinners and we need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. It's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to His mercy, he saved us. For by grace are we saved through faith. Grace means free gift. If it's not free, it's not grace. If you think you've earned your standing before a holy God based on your religion, your performance, your works, your heritage, your baptism, your sacraments, whatever it might be, you are sorely mistaken. Jesus didn't die on the cross for your sins to get you part of the way there. It's nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So we implore you to place your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation. For those of you that know the Lord, uh, continue to, to keep studying, stay in the Word, uh, research, be awake, be aware. You know, remember uh, 1 Thess 5, 6, uh, which is a verse I come back to again and again, therefore let us not sleep as others do, let us watch and be sober. And that's our calling. So, uh, Zach, any closing thoughts? Um, I just always my closing thought is, you know, all this stuff is important to be aware of and understand, but ultimately we only have one savior, one hope, and that is Jesus Christ. So don't, don't, again, I'm not telling people what to do on voting and stuff like that, but don't expect the politician to stop or save this country or this world. Only put your hope in Jesus Christ and understand that scripture tells us what's going to happen and it's going to happen. Mm. So make sure that you're right with the Lord. Most importantly. Amen. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for listening today. Uh, thanks for listening all week. Uh, don't forget to check out the new app. Search NBW Ministries on the App Store or Google Play Store. Check out our new website at notbyworks.com. 
org and check out the free section of uh, the online store. We just posted an article by Mary Danielson there. We we post things pretty regularly. It's all free. You don't need a credit card or anything. You just put it in your cart and we'll email you the PDFs. Uh, and uh, while you're there, check out some of the other books and DVDs and streaming video and things that we have if you think those uh, might be of help to you. So God bless you, everyone. And we look forward to uh, a great week next week here on the MBW podcast.